Hi everybody, I'm Curtis Mitch from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and welcome back to another weekday reflection on today's Mass readings. Today is Monday, May 3rd, and today is a feast day in the church where we celebrate the lives of the apostles Philip and James. And the Gospel reading today comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 6 to 14. Now today's gospel reading is carefully selected because it features one of those two men. It features Philip the Apostle. The question we want to ask at the beginning here is, what do we know about Philip the Apostle? We don't know a whole lot about him. We know that Philip was one of the twelve. We know that if you look at the, the lists of the apostles that appear in the Synoptic Gospels, Philip always appears in the fifth position. All right, for some reason, he's right there, nestled right in the middle of the group of the apostles. We know that Philip was from Bethsaida of Galilee, right? That's a little town on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, right where the Jordan River comes into it, into the top end of the lake. And this lake town also happens to be the same hometown as Peter and Andrew. So Peter, Philip, and Andrew all grew up together, if you will, in the same town. Now Philip in the Synoptic Gospels is a silent figure. He doesn't have any speaking parts, you might say. He's simply listed among the 12. But in the Gospel of John, Philip is pushed out a little more, he becomes a more prominent figure with speaking parts and, and with parts in the narrative. So in John 1, for example, Jesus calls Philip. The call of Philip is uniquely told in the Gospel of John. In John 6, Jesus actually tests Philip in the story of the multiplication of the loaves. He says, where are we going to get bread to feed this many people? And he's asking Philip because the event takes place near the town of Bethsaida. So Philip would know you know, what kind of resources were available for a crowd that size, and obviously they would be insufficient. So Jesus performs a miracle. In John 12, there are Greeks who come to the feast in Jerusalem, and they approach Philip and tell Philip, we wish to see Jesus. And so he plays a little role there. But today's gospel in John 14, we have the most important role of Philip at all, of, of, of all of these instances. Philip makes a request of Jesus in the upper room, and he says, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus responds by, un, uh, by, excuse me, by unfolding the inner mysteries of the Trinity. All right, that's what's taking place in today's reading. We're in the upper room. After the foot washing, in the midst of the Last Supper, Jesus begins to to unpack slowly and carefully the mystery of who God himself is, God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. So let's take a look at today's passage, and then we'll try to explain a few, few basic things. It begins in verse 6. Jesus said to him, that is to Thomas, who just asked him a question, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you know him and have seen him. That's the key thing that Jesus says. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. And Jesus says, Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it." So what's going on 
in this reading here today. Jesus is making known the Father in a new and unique way. He's actually, uh, this part of the gospel is actually building upon something that was said back at the very beginning in the prologue to John's gospel. That would be the very first 18 verses of the gospel. And in that final verse, uh, John the evangelist says, no one has ever seen God. Right? But Jesus, who's the only begotten, he has made him known. So this is the curious thing. This is the starting point for the revelation of the Trinity, is that no one has ever seen God. And yet now, with the incarnation, something unprecedented is happening. All right, Jesus is revealing that God is a father, and he's not just a father in history, Okay, the people of Israel would address God as Father. Why? Because God, the Lord God, adopted Israel to be his sons and daughters. So he's a father by adoption. But Jesus is talking about a whole nother level of fatherhood in God as he begins to make known who God really is. Okay, God, he says, is a father in eternity because God has an eternal son. His fatherhood is not just something that takes place in history. He doesn't become a father in history. He is a father for all of eternity because he has an only begotten son. And now the remarkable thing is that through the incarnation, which is the father sending that son into the world, now the father is being revealed. How can you say, show us the Father, Jesus says to Philip? Because if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the Son and not the Father. Well, indeed he is. But the Son's duty, if you will, the Son's unique prerogative is to be an image of the Father and to reveal the Father and to make him known. So now we're learning, Jesus is teaching his disciples that knowing me means knowing the Father, and seeing me means seeing the Father. St. Paul captured this in one of his letters in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15, where he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus makes visible something that is utterly invisible because, as John's prologue says, no one except the Son and the Spirit have ever seen God. And yet, Jesus comes in the flesh to make him visible, to make him known. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing that I want to point out here in today's reading is that Jesus is basically answering two important questions. The first question is, well, what is God really like? What is God really like? God is really like Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. By saying, he who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus is saying that when we, we look at Christ himself, we look at his life, we see the love of Christ. When we see the love of Christ, we're seeing the love of the Father on display in our midst. When we look at the compassion of Christ for sinners and for those who are suffering, we're seeing the compassion of God in action, made visible in the incarnate Son. When we hear the wisdom of Christ, we are hearing the wisdom that comes from God. It's the wisdom of the Father. God is making himself known. And so what that means is that, and this brings us to the second question that Jesus is answering, if we, if we were to say, why the incarnation? Why did God become man? Well, for two reasons. The obvious one is the one we know. God became man for our salvation. He came to pay the debts of our sin, right? To love the Father for all the times we have refused to love the Father by breaking his commandments. So he's come to save us from our sins. But the incarnation and the coming of the Son is more than just an act of salvation. It's also an act of revelation. God is opening himself up to us. He is introducing himself to the human race in a new way through Jesus the Son. And God is showing us that we were created to be in a relationship with him. 
Okay, and when Jesus reveals that He is the in the eternal Son of the Father, and that the Father and the Son have a spirit as well, He's showing us that God has always been a relational being. Right, there are relationships with. In God, and God is now opening that up to you and I. He is calling us into a relationship that already exists in eternity, in the ebb and flow of divine love and knowledge between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And that's what we're called to. We're called to a relationship, and a relationship with God is an adventure of discovery. I'm still learning new things about my wife and kids every day, just as you are. Imagine how. Through eternity, we will be constantly learning new things about God. All right, that's the adventure that is Christian discipleship. It's about entering into this relationship with God who has not just come to save us, he's come to reveal himself to us, to invite us into a relationship of communion and love with him now in history and, of course, with him for all eternity. I pray that this... Uh, reflection was of some benefit to you today. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day, and I look forward to seeing you here again next time. Thanks.